So next on our list, after the art of songwriting and musical performance and the craft, the know-how about arranging music and engineering, let's look at some of the nuts and bolts, the tools we use to make our recordings. We'll start with acoustics. Now, I plan to do a video in the future with a lot more about acoustics, but let's just say these few summary things. One is you want to be concerned about your acoustics in your recording room because it affects everything that you record with a mic. And you also want to be aware of your acoustics in your mixing room, the place where you listen to stuff, because you need to hear clearly everything that's happening in your mix. I also want to clear up a common misconception, which is that when people think about acoustic treatment, they say soundproofing. And there are two very, very different parts of acoustic treatment. One is what you'd call soundproofing, and the other is treating the acoustics within the room. So soundproofing is where you are trying to keep sounds that are in the studio in and sounds that are not in the studio outside. So if you're playing a drum set, you don't want your neighbors to be upset. And if you have a truck going by on the street, you don't want it to show up in your recording. Unfortunately, that's not possible to do inexpensively. You either have to build a studio from the beginning with soundproofing in mind, or you have to do very expensive and extensive reconstruction of your area. You have to deal with things like keeping all of the seals of doors and windows being airtight. You have to then, because things are airtight, include some complicated ventilation techniques so that you can still get air in there to breathe but not have it be noisy. And then you have to be concerned about isolating your studio from vibrations for things like traffic nearby. It's not cheap and it's not simple. That's what you have to do to get decent soundproofing. On the other hand, when you're just dealing with acoustic treatment, that's much less expensive and a lot easier, and it's possible to do it even in an apartment. Acoustic treatment is when you're taming the reflections inside the room so that they sound flattering to the recordings you're doing. It also helps you make sure that the tone of the room the sound of anything played in it is evenly balanced. It's not going to cause ringing or strange bass notes to stick out or anything like that. And along the lines of bass notes, bass traps, as they're called, they're very, very useful. Bass traps are special absorbers made specifically to absorb bass frequencies. This doesn't reduce the bass in the room. In fact, for a lot of places in the room, it might sound like it increases the bass because it evens it out both frequency-wise, so that there aren't certain bass notes that stick out, and spatially, so that when you move your head a few inches, the bass doesn't suddenly change its response completely. So there's one thing a little bit outside of the scope of this video, but acoustics are important in your recording chain. Next, let's look at transducers. And first, what are transducers? Simply, they're microphones and speakers. In other words, the bridge is between the acoustic and the analog domains. They are often, at least when you're going for a transparent sound, one of the most influential factors in the sound you're going to get. Obviously, if other people are going to listen to your songs on their playback systems, there's a bunch of transducers you have no control over. So you'll want to try to compromise so that your song sounds as good as possible on as many speakers as possible. Let's move on to gear in general, and I've found two metaphors that are very useful when you're thinking about what gear do I want to purchase, and how can I improve my setup so that things sound better? Of course, number one is your own engineering skill, and we all can work at that for a lifetime. So the two metaphors are panes of glass and how transparent they are, and the other metaphor is a chain with links that are weak and strong. So let's start with this panes of glass idea. Now, obviously, recording and playback are different from live acoustic sound. If you are hearing an acoustic source firsthand, that's like really being somewhere and seeing what's happening. The most basic type of recording you can do with no processing or anything is like viewing the sound through a stack of panes of glass. Each one of those panes can be transparent, or it can highly color the sound, or it can be somewhere in between. Now, obviously, you usually want to do some sort of processing to the sound, so transparency is not always the goal, but the problem is you can't take effects off. You can't totally EQ out the sound of a room or a transducer or a preamp or anything like that. It's easy to add effects, but you can't usually subtract them. So it's usually the best practice to go for as transparent of a sound as possible unless you're absolutely sure that you want a certain tone color. So I brought a visual aid. 
I have a neighbor who has a cow sculpture in their yard, and I took a picture, and standing there on the corner of the street, I can actually see this cow sculpture. Now, let's pretend that that photograph, the way it is, is the live sound. So if we're going to play that back and record it in our analogy, that's like having one pane of glass, two panes of glass, each adding their own color to the sound. And in the end, the result is not as clear as actually being there. What you just saw is a fairly low quality playback and recording system. So if you have really nice equipment, it's relatively transparent. In other words, the recording and the playback have a much more subtle influence on the sound. Here's what we see most of the time when we're dealing with recorded music that's recorded professionally. The recording is very transparent, at least for the case of some genres of music, but then our playback system is not at all. Maybe we're listening on a phone without any headphones plugged in. Now you could have things the other way around as well. You might have a recording that was done with poor quality, say it was in a noisy room or with just a, a little portable recorder or something like that, and you're playing it back on a very nice system. As you can see, it's profoundly influenced by the recording and not as much by the playback. Or when things get really strange, you might have a recording that greatly influences the sound quality and playback that influences the sound in its own way and you get something that's hard to tell exactly what the original was. Now here's the thing that I'm kind of leaving out for now in this analogy. And that is often we'll use pieces of gear that somehow enhance the sound. But I do want to draw an important distinction in that enhancing the sound is the opposite of transparent, just in a different direction from the kind of negative examples we've been using. Making it sound better for a particular purpose is still changing it from the original. So yes, you do want to do that some of the time, but for our purposes right now, we're leaving that out.